Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. We start O level biology June 2020. This is paper 215090. And uh, we should be doing this paper and uh, making some general topics which are confusing. Uh, a better comprehension should develop. And I hope you do the paper well. All know the paper is for one hour 45 minutes. So please try to finish it in the appropriate time and then of course read your answers once again and see if you have any made any careless mistakes because uh, you can make anything from three to five marks of careless mistakes which somewhere you haven't written the unit somewhere you haven't written the correct uh, wording so please go through the paper and leave your last 15 minutes to recheck your paper now, as we read through question one the diagram shows the pathway taken by a hormone from cell a where it is produced to cell c that it affects so cell a you can see it here and then it's the molecule of hormone and then you see it entering some sort of a tube this is the tube that they're showing you then that goes to the heart and then there's another tube and then we see something coming out of the tube you can see here it's coming out of the tube here it was coming into the tube now you see all these things and then it says blood vessel b here it was cell A and then it's blood vessel B and then it's cell C and then that molecules of hormone are then moving into the cell C. Structures are not drawn to the same scale. Now identify the type of blood vessel B. Now that was very simple. Blood vessel B, you know there are three types of blood vessels. So it has to be an artery or a vein or a capillary. And you know that the capillary has a very thin wall, so it will allow, it's actually permeable, it allows, it's leaky, it's got holes in it, so it allows the stuff to move in and out of, uh, that's the only blood vessel which allows stuff to move in and out. So identify the type of blood vessel that was capillary, then explain the ways in which this type of blood vessel is adapted for the transport of hormone molecules, in fact, for any anything which was transported through the blood vessels. So number one, we say that they are narrow, then they are one cell thick, or you see they're leaky. One cell thick doesn't even actually signify that they can, they have pores in it, and then, you know, things can move out of it. And the fact that they are uh, a large surface area, so they run very close to the body cells, and then they can uptake of the hormone uh, by diffusion. So these are the four, uh, these are four marks, and there were many mark scheme points for you to answer this part of the question. Then it says state how the molecule of the hormone, so this is part three. State how molecules of the hormone are transported through blood vessel B. Now that was something very simple, but I'm sure at that minute in the exam, you probably did not think of it. So they're transported in solution, in the blood and in the plasma. So you could have said it in one sentence that the hormones are transported in the blood uh, plasma as a solution, and you could have got your two out of two in this. As you can see, the same question continues on to the B part. For a named hormone, identify the gland containing cell A, so where it is produced, an organ containing cell C, where it works, and a function or effect of the hormone you have named. So the named hormone was insulin. Uh, the gland where it is produced is in actually the beta cells of the pancreas, or if you just said pancreas, you got a mark for that. Where does it work? It either works in the liver cells or the muscle cells. You could have said liver and muscle cells. Uh, when I put a slash here, it means either of these should have been used. Either you said liver or you said muscle. Uh, even if you said both, you'd still get one mark. Then the function or effect of the named hormone, naturally, what was it going to do? It was going to take uptake. The glucose was going to be taken from the blood and enter the liver cells. And then, of course, it was going to be converted to glycogen. Glucose is a monosaccharide. Glycogen is a polysaccharide. It's a large molecule. It's an insoluble molecule. It's a compact molecule. So it would be stored in the liver cell so that whenever you needed it, it would be cached. It's like I always say, it's like a 5,000 rupee dot. And you would cache it, and the glucose would then enter the blood. And you would, of course, like, for instance, these days we are fasting, so we have food in the morning and the whole day we are dependent on this glycogen, which is going to be releasing all the glucose. Then the last part of the question was easy. Cell C is one of the number of similar cells making up an organ. State the name given to organs affected by hormones. Now, those, of course, are called the target organs. And this is, of course, a point of the syllabus. 
uh, in which this was asked. Question two, uh, A1, name a substance in a healthy diet, a lack of which leads to soft bones in a child. Now that is calcium and vitamin D. Uh, name a food that contains this substance. If you said vitamin D, then it would be liver, cheese, and egg yolks. If you said calcium, it would be soya beans, sardines, and spinach. So uh, these are the things which you could have mentioned uh, depending whether you said, so I've used the same color vitamin D's and yellow. So the things which are rich in vitamin D would be these and the ones which have calcium would be these. Then it says two groups of people, two groups of people E and F eat different types of diet. The graph shows the average time taken for food to pass through the elementary canal for these two groups. So you can see here, there's a group E here and uh, there's a group F here. You can see there's a dark line and then there's a sort of a grayish line and a black line and the average time taken 5 to 15 hours. So proportion of people in each group. Now look at this graph very carefully and then of course you can uh, understand this graph and see uh, the proportion of people who were having average time in hours. So understand the graph very carefully. Now if you just shade it a different color, so look, let's shade this red. Now if you look at the group E people, these are the group E people. And let's shade this and let's have a look at it. So there was a large proportion of people in each group who are having over 45 hours the time taken for to the food to pass through the elementary canal and then let's look at the group f people let's let's shade that another color and let's look at that again now the group f people here is oh very few very few people in which it was taking so these are the group f people which i'm shading in blue and then we have the group f people here it mostly of them they pass the food pass through them in 16 to 25 hours and for 5 to 15 hours. Now, when you look at this graph, it tells you a very interesting fact that, you know, which groups the food is taking longer. So the graph shows the average time taken for food to pass through the elementary canal for these two groups. So do this exercise and, you know, understand the graph, spend a little time on it and try to understand the graph before you start reading the question and answering it. As we see the first part it says name the process. That was a very direct question. Uh, name the process that causes food to pass through the elementary canal peristalsis. Then suggest how the diets of the two groups of people may be different and give reasons for your answer. Now the reasons for your answer were very easy. I put the E on one side and the F on the other side. So the E people, it took so food takes longer to pass through the elementary canal. Maybe they were eating more meat. Uh, maybe they were constipated. The F people in which it was going very fast, they had more fiber, more bulk for peristalsis. So we had to make something to make a connection between the graph and their diets. So, you know, meat doesn't have any fiber in it. And if they're constipated, of course, that means the feces stay inside the intestine for a longer time. But if it was going faster, it meant they were having more fiber. And what does fiber do? Fiber adds bulk to the feces. So it is going to help to push it along the elementary canal and so it will pass out of the body much faster if you have a lot of fiber like a lot of fruit or a lot of vegetables. Look at the C part of the question. Suggest reasons why it may be a disadvantage for food to pass through the elementary canal too quickly. Well, less time for food to be absorbed, uh, causing malnutrition, may have diarrhea. So that means the food is passing very fast. You know, sometimes when you have some sort of amoebic or bacterial infection, then you, of course you have diarrhea. Diarrhea means frequent passage of watery feces, means that the feces are being passed out in very quick, very quickly out of the intestine and they're watery and a lot of fluid is being lost as well and the person can get dehydrated. And of course, the last point was may not have a balanced diet and so they are, the food is, is passing through the elementary canal too quickly and that is resulting in less absorption and, of course, resulting in malnutrition. Let's come to question three. Uh, the photograph shows an insect called a leafhopper. When it feeds, its mouth parts penetrate the xylem of the plant on which it lives. So that is something which they've told you in the question. Then it says leafhoppers carry disease-causing bacteria from plant to plant. 
So from one plant, they take up some bacteria and then they take it to other plant. And then when they are taking the injecting the xylem and taking the water out of the xylem, they, they transfer that. So state the term used for a disease causing organism pathogen. Pathogen is a disease causing microorganism. State the term used for an animal such as an insect that carries disease causing organism. That would be the vector. Then it says the bacteria carried by the leaf hopper reproduce inside the plant sterum and block the xylem. So you see you have to remember what is the function of the xylem. Xylem transports water and ions from the soil to the upper parts of the plant. So suggest and explain why this can cause the leaves of the plant to wilt. If you block the xylem, well why is it going to wilt? So we've got to think of it, what does the xylem do? Xylem transports water and ions from the soil to the other parts of the plant. So suggest and explain why this can cause the leaves of the plant to wilt. So water lost from the leaves by evaporation or transpiration, they cannot be replaced. So water lost from cells lose their turgidity. So the plant, the leaves of the plant will wilt. Part two says the leaves of plants affected by these bacteria, they also develop white patches. Now the white patches means now there's no chlorophyll, there's, there's no green part. Suggest reasons for this. Suggest is always, I tell you, difficult. It's something very basic, but at that time, maybe you can't think of it. So cannot make chlorophyll. White patches mean there's no more green air. Green means no chlorophyll. And probably because there's no magnesium getting into the leaves. And you know for chlorophyll, you need magnesium. And the magnesium comes from the soil. So if there's no magnesium, there's no chlorophyll. Part three of the question says, suggest an explanation for the fact that the fruits of plants affected by these bacteria are small and poorly developed. Suggest an explanation for the fact that the fruits of plants which are affected are small and poorly developed. Naturally, if the leaves are all, you know, they've lost the chlorophyll, so there's going to be less photosynthesis, less glucose made, less water available to fruit because if the xylem gets blocked, so less nutrients sent to fruit and less nitrates, so less protein, so less growth. So all makes very much sense. Less photosynthesis, less photosynthetic area. Less photosynthetic area means less glucose made. Then if the xylem is blocked, less water available to fruit and then less nutrients sent to the fruit. So nutrients means like nitrates uh, from the soil or other nitrates, phosphates, sulfates. So less nitrates, uh, so less proteins. So less growth. So this is what we need to understand is what was the explanation to this. The question four was explain the importance of the production of carbon dioxide in bread making. You see when we knead the dough we then add the yeast and everything and that of course yeast respires and produces carbon dioxide and the carbon dioxide we say makes the dough rise and that's what gives the bread a very very soft and a very spongy sort of a texture and it's very different than roti which we make and in that we don't let the uh, dough rise so it makes the dough rise or it adds a different texture to the bread that is the reason why we actually do this in bread making then the diagram uh, the b part of the question says the diagram shows a flow chart for some of the chemical reactions that occur during bread making so we have starch we have uh, maltose to glucose and then we have something g here and then glucose to carbon dioxide and then we have something H here and then ethanol. So name the process occurring at G and H is digestion and at H of course when glucose to carbon dioxide and ethanol is anaerobic respiration. Now look there were three marks for this. Now the one mark is for digestion, one mark is for anaerobic and the third mark is for respiration. So anaerobic respiration, I'm not saying you put this, uh, put this here in between, just write anaerobic respiration and you would get of course, these pointers that I put means it's one mark scheme point. So digestion, one mark, anaerobic respiration, two marks, and this is how you got your three marks. Um, part C of the question, part C of the question was then again, explain what is causing the changes at G. Now the changes at G are because of amylase and amylase converts starch to maltose and then maltase and the maltase is, uh, why maltase? Because it's going to convert the maltose to glucose. So three marks and the name of the two enzymes and the, uh, the reactions which they are catalyzing. Then part D1, state the name of the microorganism used in bread making and the group of organism to which it belongs. Now that makes sense, yeast, 
and the group of organism is fungi then state two characteristics of organism in this group means the fungus group naturally the fungus has a cell wall which is made up of chitin it has cytoplasm and it has a nuclei cell nuclei and it has hyphae and mycelium or mycelium which are the thread like structures which are present in uh, some of the fungi so these were the characteristics of the organisms in this group so basically you were going to give me the characteristics of fungi then question 5 a the passage describes the nucleus of a cell with missing words replaced by the letters j k l and m read the passage then select words from the list below the passage to replace letters j k l and m in the nucleus of a body cell from a person with down syndrome there are j thread like structures now j would be 47 thread like structures so we've got that here then the structures called k and k is going to be chromosomes these are made of many units called l genes that instruct the cell to produce a particular m and that m would be protein so these were the names which we were supposed to know and this was of course a very important part of the syllabus which they have asked you then it says when suddenly exposed to bright light some people automatically sneeze usually i mean we don't sneeze when we are exposed to bright light somebody puts a torch in your eye or something and shines a torch in your eye so well you're not going to sneeze this is known as a photic sneeze reflex when suddenly exposed to bright light some people automatically sneeze and this is known as a photic sneeze reflex so these people sneeze okay fine now the photic sneeze reflex is a result of the possession of a dominant allele now i've told you this in previous questions also if somebody has a dominant trait you have to be either this or this so if i say okay this is a dominant trait then the person with that dominant trait can only be either this which is homozygous dominant and heterozygous so this is something which you have to remember use a genetic diagram to show how parents both with a photosphotic sneeze reflex can have a child who is not affected by it. so we see we realize if those affected are this so the not affected will be this this makes sense because one is a dominant trait and one is a recessive trait so the person who sneezes is this or this the person who does not sneeze has to be then small a small a because he or he or she has to be the recessive person so how can a parent not having or a parent who sneezes are big a small a that is the only way you can have a child with small a small a because one small a has to come from the mother and one small a has to come from the father so how would you write this is parental genotype then gametes and then parental uh, then offspring genotype which is here which i have given you here in uh, brown here your offspring genotype here and then this would be the one which i have given in red is the offspring phenotype here so the four uh, the four lines are number one parental genotype second gametes then offspring genotype and then offspring phenotype uh, then we come to question 6 which is of course the essay questions section b suggest why a car driver who is driving under the influence of alcohol or heroin is more likely to have an accident than a driver who is free of these drugs now the reason is that these are depressants alcohol and heroin both are depressants they depress the central nervous system doesn't say it doesn't mean that makes you depressed when you go into depression no 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 it's a depressant of the central nervous system so impulses uh, pass more slowly between neurons and it takes a longer time to react to a situation or you say it slows down reflexes either you say it takes longer to react to situations so we say longer reaction times or you say it slows down reflexes so that was a three mark and you had to with a four mark scheme points then we come to the b part of the question now the b part of the question said describe other harmful effects of these drugs on people who use them for long periods of time and then they they have given you a heading alcohol and then they have given you a heading heroin now the points that i have given you in red you could have written for either alcohol or heroin uh 
it's addiction, loss of inhibition, damage to liver, loss of memory, loss of appetite, criminal activities in order to get money to buy alcohol or heroin. And then, of course, monetary loss means you lose money. Naturally, you've got to spend money to buy alcohol. And of course, the family system is also disturbed. Points which you could only write for alcohol, I've given you here in green, clumsiness, uh, mouth and throat cancer, and of course, it damages the central nervous system. Then the points that you could have written for heroin were insomnia and risk of uh, infection from needles because, you know, heroin is can either be smoked, injected, or sniffed. So if you use the injection method, then there's a risk of infection when you share needles and you could get blood-borne infections like hepatitis and AIDS. Next, we come on to question seven. A, describe how changes in gene structure may be caused. Uh, naturally, that can only be gene means the changes in the DNA, and that could only be by radiation, UV light, gamma rays, X-rays, or either by chemicals like tar and cigarette smoke, and of course, that results in a mutation. And the B part of the question was explain how changes in gene structure may eventually lead to evolution of a species evolution of a species so causes first of all uh, changes in the gene structure will cause a change in the appearance or the phenotype of a person or an animal or an organism and then of course this will result in variation now if there is a change in the environment now some of these may have been advantageous changes like for instance if there's a snow and there's a very uh, pure white rabbit produced by mutation. Now that is going to be very well camouflaged in the snow, so it will be saved. Now, if this white rabbit is saved, now that is an advantageous mutation. And then, of course, these white rabbits have the survival of the fittest, so they will survive. And this, of course, will be then called natural selection. Now, these white rabbits will reproduce and will pass on their advantageous alleles to their offspring. So they will inherit, the offsprings will inherit these characteristics. And over a period of time, after many, many years, maybe now they are a separate species because they do not mate with the previous rabbits. Why? Because their mating behavior has changed or maybe they are not recognized. So they will breed only with a similar type. So the evolution of a species has occurred. So this is a very difficult question. Some of you are unable to write it, but there's sometimes very general points which you can write for every question on evolution of species. Now, next, let's come to question 8a. A list the structures within a plant leaf. List the structures within a plant leaf that do not possess chloroplast. So cuticle does not have any chloroplast. Epidermis does not have any chloroplast. And xylem and phloem do not have any chloroplasts. So four marks, and these were the four possible answers that you could have given. And it said structures within a plant leaf. So you couldn't have come up with stem or things like that, which many of you would have come up with, like roots do not have any chloroplast, but they didn't ask you that. Then it says explain the importance to a plant of guard cells. So explain the importance of a plant to guard cells. Guard cells do what? Guard cells are the one which are going to control the opening and closing of the stomata. So they control transpiration. What is transpiration? Transpiration is the loss of water vapors from the leaf through the stomata. So the guard cells control the opening and closing of the stomata. So they control transpiration and they also allow the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide. For what? Oxygen for respiration and carbon dioxide for photosynthesis. So for respiration, separate point, and photosynthesis, separate point. So there was one, two, three, four, five, six mark scheme points for a four marks. So any four of these, and you got your full marks. Then, of course, it says explain the importance of to a plant of first guard cell. Then it said root hair cells. Now, root hair cells are large surface area for what? For uptake of water, for uptake of ions. And for oxygen as well, because you see the oxygen also enters through the root hair cells because they are also living. They respire. That is why what you do is you plow the land before you plant the seeds, because when the plant grows, then the roots need some air and there must be air spaces in the soil. That is why the gardener comes and rakes the soil and so improves the air content of the soil. 
if the air is compact if the if the soil is very very compact and there's no air spaces the roots will die that is what happens in certain lawns and all where people cross that area and walk through that area where the soil becomes very very hard and compacted then of course no plants are going to grow there so this is how that patch will the people if people walk that area then there's going to be grass on either side and that part of the area where people walk very regularly then of course there'll be no grass there because when they walk on it the soil becomes hard and there are no more air spaces in the soil and the roots cannot survive there so the plants will die so root hair cells so the last question which is uh, question 9a describe the similarities and differences in the functions of a motor and a sensory neuron uh, similarities both carry impulses uh, very quickly very fast 100 meters per second over long distances and during a reflex action so similarities and differences in the functions of a motor and sensory neuron and then of course differences was motor neurons carry impulses from the central nervous system to the effector which could be a muscle or a gland and the sensory neurons carry impulses from the receptor to the central nervous system. Then the B part of it said, describe the functions of the following parts of the brain. Uh, the cerebrum, reasoning abilities, speech, movement, hearing, recognition, sight, all of this is controlled by the cerebral, cerebrum. These, the main cerebral hemispheres. Uh, so reasoning abilities, speech, hearing, and then the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus, of course, controls homeostasis, osmoregulation, and uh, it also controls the secretions by the pituitary gland, which is just below it. So there is a there is a sort of a connection between the two. Home hypothalamus is just above, and then the pituitary gland is just below it. So this is how we had to give you about the homeostasis was one mark, and the other mark was controls the pituitary secretions. So that completes this paper and I hope uh, this has been helpful to you all and uh, please do watch these videos and I hope this is uh, going to improve your uh, biological uh, skills in exam skills, how to answer questions. You see, basically you need to know your syllabus, but you also need to know how to take the exam and how to write and how to briefly express yourself. And thank you very much and uh, all the very best.